I did. Well, I heard a little bit. I just heard, I just heard kind of like about Bush. He said that, um, he said it was good to, what was it? Yeah, I hope so. I don't know. I don't know her personally, but I mean, I've heard. Uh, yeah. I've heard she was a God fearing woman, so hopefully she was, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, God knows people's hearts. I try not to judge politicians too much because, uh, at least by what they say, because, you know, they always say whatever they can <laughs> to appeal to the masses. But uh, you got to go more by what they do, right, by, by their life. But, yeah, I've heard she was a godly woman. So if she was, praise God for that. We need, we need more, more godliness in this nation. Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> so um, I'm sorry for being a little bit late, guys. Those of you in here and those of you watching. I was, uh, I got cut up talking with somebody about the Lord. <laughs> so anyways, how are you guys doing tonight? Good? Okay, good. I'm doing good as well. Praise God. Um, I'm doing great. I'm getting ready for... My, uh, my little baby girl to come. Um, she's supposed to come on Friday. I don't know. She could come before then. But we're all getting ready. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Before we know it. So. Right. So looking forward to that and um, looking forward to my wife being it not not feeling tired all the time. So. Praise God. You get anxious at the end, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you guys could pray for us, um, we would greatly appreciate that. Just, you know, we believe everything's going to go well, um, but it's always good to have believers praying for you and believing the same thing. So we definitely appreciate that. Praise God. All right. So we are in lesson 12 tonight, um, but we're going to go ahead and review the discipleship questions from lesson 11 first. All right, so lesson 11 here. Number one is the Lord our God. Number two is wealth. Number three is that he may establish his covenant. Number four is shout for joy and be glad. Number five is pleasure and the prosperity of his servant. Number six is E, all of the above. Seven is whosoever. Eight is doubt. Nine is believe. Ten is that those things we shall say, I'm sorry, that those things we say shall come to pass. Number 11 is whatsoever we say. Number 12 is that we receive them. 13 is have them. 14 is our most holy faith. 15 is tongue. And 16 is the fruit thereof. Fruit thereof. Okay. Uh, does anybody need me to repeat any of those? We're good? Okay, awesome. Awesome. How many of you guys are doing the homework? <laughs> are you just showing up to class and just, just copying them down? No. No, you, get, I, you guys are, you guys are, uh, I know y'all are paying attention and we're learning together. Amen. Praise God. The path of the just uh, shines brighter and brighter under the perfect day. Amen. So as we continue to, to grow, you know, I was just talking with somebody out there about this. I'm sorry, with, with Pastor uh, Richard, children's pastor Richard, and was talking with him about this. And, you know, it's God, God uh, positions us in certain seasons to, to grow. And, um, you know, as we were talking about, it's the way, it's the same way that you position a plant, you know, <clears throat> depending on the type of plant that it is and how mature it is and how, how, um, how much it's grown, you either expose it to more sun or, <clears throat> or less sun or more rainy conditions or, or, or less 
uh, wet conditions. Um, and you, you allow that plant to grow in each maturity level and stage. And that's how God is with us, you know. We're like plants that God is, is seeking to position um, at, at different stages in our life in the right place, surrounding us with the right people to allow us to grow in that particular season in our life. Amen? So here we are at Vision Church on Wednesday night, and the Lord is growing us up. How many of you guys believe that? I believe that. I believe I'm growing. Amen? So, so that we can better be prepared for life and the things that, that are coming in life. So, anyways, with that said, let's jump into this in Lesson 12. God has already provided, and uh, y'all can follow along in your outlines there. Let's go ahead and first pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight, this evening. God, it's a beautiful evening, and uh, we just come here to honor you, to praise you, and to, to bow down to you in our hearts, God, and to submit to your, to your spoken word, submit to um, your Holy Spirit's guidance and leading, because we thank you that he is leading us tonight. And we just thank you that he's leading us into all truth and all freedom and all life. And we're so excited about the journey and the road that he has us on. And we thank you that you're faithful, God. Your grace is enough to get us to the end of our journey, to our destination. And we thank you that along the way, um, for all the things you're going to use us to do, for all the things you're doing inside of us, for all the lives you're going to use us to touch, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So lesson 12 here. So God has already done it. He has already provided everything we will ever need. It is already a done deal. As soon as we believe and begin learning how his power works, we can make things manifest. Notice there, we can make things manifest. Amen? <clears throat> I heard something very discouraging the other day. I wasn't discouraged. Um, but I'm just kind of tired of this whole teaching and belief that this person said so-and-so... One of their, and it's nobody we know, okay? So I don't think it's anybody we know. It's nobody we know. Um, but he was saying that his, one of his relatives got diagnosed with some kind of cancer, colon cancer, whatnot. And he said that he prayed to the Lord for healing. And he said that Jesus just said, that, that Jesus just um, decided that it's not time for his brother to be healed yet. And I was just thinking, I was like, I mean, doesn't that just sound crazy? Jesus like, nope. I don't want him to be healed of cancer yet. I want him to suffer more and go through the pain. And I was just thinking, I was like, man, where, where, do, we, where do we get this? I believe that that belief that God controls things and God determines whether you're healed or not, I, I really believe that it is a satanic belief. And um, I, those who believe it, I'm not saying that they're in a satanic cult or anything like that. But I, but I am saying that it's satanic in the sense that Satan uses that to, to discourage so many hearts and just to lay down and take it from the enemy, you know? And like we've been teaching about on Sundays, we're called to stand up and fight. We're not called to just lay down and say, well, you know, I didn't feel anything when I prayed. I didn't see anything happen, so Jesus just not be ready to heal me yet. Jesus already healed us over 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross and rose again. He, the, the, the lashes were already laid on his body for our healing. By his stripes, we were healed. Amen? I never see Jesus tell somebody in the, in the word of God. And brothers and sisters, this is what we're called to do is to base our beliefs on God's word, not on tradition. Amen? Or what we've heard in, in some church in a traditional sense. So, you know, the word, Jesus never told somebody... You know, I don't want to heal you yet. You need to suffer a little bit longer because I'm trying to teach you something that will heal you. Like, that never happened. Jesus was always happy for people when they received. You know, the, the woman with the issue of blood, she came and touched the hem of his garment. And right then, the, blood, the flow of blood stopped, and she was healed. And Jesus said, who touched me? And when he found it, it was her. He said, he says, go your way, woman. He said, your, your faith has made you whole. What, what does that mean? That means that. That issue in her body, that physical ailment, she was broken. That's what Jesus, see, it's the healing that made her whole. Amen? And the sickness meant that she was broken. Like, Jesus came to make us whole. He's not trying to let us suffer through brokenness. Amen? I mean, when it, you know, when it comes to sickness, it's just, it's just amazing to me how people think. And I believe that this... That doctrine is like a cancer in the body of Christ, that it has killed so many Christians 
Because instead of standing up and fighting, they just give into it. Amen? And again, I'm not condemning anybody who thinks that way. I am condemning the doctrine itself, though. Because it is not in the Bible. It's just not. Jesus never allowed people to be sick. Jesus never... If, if sickness was sometimes God's will to teach us a lesson and to grow us up in maturity, which is what Christians think, obviously... Why didn't the Father inflict Jesus with sickness? Why did Jesus never suffer any kind of sickness? Amen? <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, if, if, if the Father uses sickness to grow us up, because Jesus, it says that he grew in wisdom, and he, and he grew. So Jesus wasn't just born with all the wisdom in the world. We, do you understand that? Jesus grew in wisdom on, on this physical earth. Amen? The Father never used sickness one time to teach him a lesson or to grow him up. It's just amazing to me that we as Christians think that about God, that he does that to us. And it's like, well, Jesus may not want to heal you yet. Well, you know, where, first of all, where, where does that come from? Why wouldn't he want to heal me right now? Amen? Um, so, anyways, <laughs> we can make things manifest with our faith. As Jesus said to that woman with the issue of blood, your faith has made you whole. Amen? Jesus gets excited when we are made whole. Jesus gets excited when we put our trust in God and our brokenness is taken away and Jesus comes and just makes us whole. He's excited about that. Like, that's his will for us. Amen? And we can make that manifest and happen by faith in him. Hallelujah, by faith in him. So many of the greatest healing evangelists understood this concept. They might not have taught it from the same scriptures or expressed it in the same uh, terminology, but they believed it. John G. Lake had over 100,000 confirmed documented cases of healing. They actually closed down a hospital in Spokane, Washington for a period of time because so few people needed their services. He and his healing technicians were that effective. Since Lake had such a fruitful ministry, we ought to consider his opinion. He felt that the main reason that people didn't see healing manifest in their lives was passivity in receiving. They would pray, ask, and then passively wait on God to heal them, not understanding that he has already done it. Instead of taking their authority and commanding healing into manifestation now, they let it drag out over days, weeks, months, and years. They didn't understand how to believe God and make what he had already done in the spirit come into the physical world. In John G. Lake's estimation, that was the number one problem. And I, see that, and I see that today in the body of Christ. And again, I'm not attacking people. I'm not. I am attacking doctrine, false doctrine. That is hindering us and keeping us from God's best, which is healing to be made whole. Amen? So, <clears throat> God has already done it. Believe it is already provided, and then receive it by faith. If you don't immediately see the physical manifestation of what you prayed for, then you need to get in and start battling your own unbelief. Receive wisdom if there's something that you need to do. If demonic power is involved, break it. But the scripture clearly establishes the principle that God has already done it. And thank God for the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, he'll reveal it to you. you know? if, if there is some kind of demonic uh, influence or presence behind um, a certain sickness or ailment or disease... The Holy Spirit will show you. No, what I would say is that, you know, the, the kingdom of God is not about formulas. It's, it's, not a, it's not a math equation. Everything is unique and different in every situation. And, and praise God for the Holy Spirit because, you know, he, no healing happens the same way. I would say every healing is different. You, you hear testimonies of healings and pretty much every, every testimony is different. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you specifically on you receiving your healing. Amen? He'll give you a specific word that will touch your heart and encourage you. That if he had spoken that same word to me, I wouldn't be that encouraged or that uplifted. But he knows how to reach you. Amen? He knows how to strengthen you and encourage you to stand for God's best in your life. So listen to the Spirit. I'm not condemning anybody who has an ailment or a sickness. You know... Um, I've dealt with, with things in my life that have come against me, and um, they, they still come against me, but praise God, we need to stand. Amen? And we need to fight for what is rightfully ours. Hallelujah. So, 
um, if demonic power is involved, break it. But the scripture clearly establishes the principle that God has already done it. So in, in Mark 8, 22 to 26, Jesus operated in this same understanding. And he, Jesus, comes to Bethsaida, and, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw, you know, right, if he saw, okay. A again, Jesus didn't go, when Jesus healed every single blind man, he didn't rub mud on every single blind man's, on, uh, every single blind man's eyes. Every, everybody's healing is, is different in how they receive. So, and, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly, and he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. So this is an unusual example of healing. It's the only time in Scripture where Jesus asked a person something like, How is it? After he prayed for them. It's also the only time he ever prayed for a physical need a second time. So this was a very unique situation. Now notice, first of all, that Jesus was in Bethsaida, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Some people think Jesus did weird things just to keep us off balance. And they say, you can never figure God out. He's got no rhyme or reason. He just delights in doing things in unusual ways. And that, that's just simply not true. This was the creator of the universe in all its meticulous detail. And everything is perfect and works together in harmony. You can predict where the stars will be a million years from now, should the Lord tarry, or 10,000 years ago, because it is so ordered. It's absurd to think that the God of order himself would do things in a completely random manner. It is simply not true. God has a reason, amen, for, for how he does things. So Jesus led this man out of the town because Bethsaida was one of the worst places that he had ever been. In Luke 10, 13, it says, Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in, um, I don't know, is it Tyre, Tyre, <laughs> and Sidon, uh, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So Jesus pronounced judgment upon Bethsaida because of all of its unbelief. And the Lord encountered this in his own hometown of Nazareth as well. In Mark 6, 5 through 6, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus wanted to do more in those places, but could not. Somebody say could not. Jesus, it says here, he could not do a mighty work. That, that blows tradition and religion out of the water. Well, God is all powerful. God is almighty. God, God can do anything he wants to do at any time. No, he can't. Let's see, I got religious folk mad at me. <laughs> I'm not saying you guys, I don't know, hopefully not, but maybe somebody online is mad at me right now. But the thing is, just because God is all powerful, but just because God is all powerful does not mean that he has the authority to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Authority and power are different. Yet, yeah, God is all powerful. He can do anything abundantly above what we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Amen? God does not have the authority to do whatever he wants when he wants. Jesus could not. That doesn't mean he didn't have the power to. That just means he wasn't, he wasn't able to. Why? Because of their unbelief. Their unbelief... Um, it did, their, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I word this right. Their unbelief negated the power of God. I want us to chew on that for a minute. Their unbelief negated the power of God. It doesn't matter how powerful God is. If your unbelief can negate the power of God. Amen? Brother, did you have something you wanted to say? I saw you. That's exactly right. Unbelief kept... Um, the people in, because it was Nazareth that Jesus went to, <coughs> unbelief kept them from receiving their healing. It's, it's not that Jesus didn't want to, because it says here, 
that Jesus wanted to. But he actually marveled at their unbelief, and he could not do. It, it didn't say there that Jesus would not do a mighty work. It says he could not. He wanted to, but yeah, their unbelief negated the power of God. See, what, what, that's what's crazy to me is why aren't churches teaching this? You know, like, this is clearly what the word teaches. And it's not just in that one scripture. I mean, over and over again, we see that, you know? So, anyways, let's move on. Jesus wanted to do more in those places, but couldn't. These people were not in faith, so we couldn't pray for them other than for a few minor things. So Jesus operated in faith 100%. So we know there was no problem with him. But there must be some degree of faith on the part of those receiving. Now, I believe that's been blown way out of proportion. We sometimes use this as an excuse to, to put all the blame on the person receiving if the healing does not manifest. Oh, yeah, most definitely. But how does that fit into the scenario? Because Mary had no belief. What if, you know what I'm saying? Can, yeah. Can, I would say they would have, they would have to believe. Well, they, they would have to. There's this instance where people in God's heal that didn't believe they were going to heal. I have seen examples of that, and I would say that's probably more. When the gift of healing is in operation, because the Bible does talk about having um, the gifting of healing. And there are some in the body of Christ who uh, they clearly have a healing ministry, you know, and they have more of the like, like, um, like Todd White, for example. You know, he just goes on the streets and and, you know, he'll talk to people and say, hey, let me pray for you. But but here's the thing, though, is is they even though they may not like have believed as a believer would like, yes. Because they're, they're ignorant. You know, they don't understand about, like, God's grace and faith. And, you know, as a more mature Christian obviously would. Um, but they still allowed him to pray for them. And I think God is just looking for an opening into somebody's life to, to minister to them. So in, in, there are certain cases where, I, like I said, I believe that um, the, the gift of healing is an operation. And it also depends upon how strong in faith the person who's praying um, is. You know, if you have a person who's very strong in their faith when it comes to healing, and they're praying over people, even if the other person, um, even, if, even if they, if, if they even have the slightest evidence of faith, uh, you know, I believe they'll be healed. Because the person praying is strong and is so strong in faith. And the thing with Jesus is, Jesus obviously was 100% in faith. I mean, I mean, there's, he didn't have any unbelief. He never doubted the power of God that God was, when he went to pray over Lazarus, he said, Lord, you know, I thank you that, that you've, you've given me, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but you've given me the power to do this. And I thank you that it's going to bring you glory. And he, and he called Lazarus forth and Lazarus came out and, and was healed. Amen. But these people in Nazareth, I believe they just completely rejected him and said, no. You know, we we know you growing up. You're you're not the um, you're you're not the son of God. You know, you're just, we saw you running around with with your father Joseph. If that really is your father, you know, we don't know. Mary was messing around, and she got pregnant before her and Joseph even came together. So th that would have been the case. Is they just completely just rejected Jesus? Amen. Um, but does that help answer your question, Doug? Okay, I want to make sure I answer it thoroughly. You know? Praise God. Said, good. And two, he said, it's still good while the rest is coming home for you. Well, good. That's what, see? That's what we're believing for. Amen? That's, that's what you want, the, the good report. And that's what you, that's what you got to do is you've got to, when a bad report is presented to you, you know, you've got you've to get your eyes on Jesus and look at the good report and say, I'm not letting go of the good report and, until I see it, you know? So that's awesome. So we just continue, we just thank God for that. And we continue to believe for complete healing. Amen? Complete healing. But that's awesome. Well, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord. You are such a good God. We thank you that you are the God of healing. We thank you, Lord, that you will never let us down. 
We thank you, Lord, that you came to, to make us whole. You came to lift burdens. You came to, to break uh, yokes off of us, Lord God. And we thank you that you are for us and not against us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> again, Jesus operating in faith 100%. So we know there is no problem with him, but there, there must be some degree of faith on the part of those receiving. And again, now I must believe, uh, now I believe that's been blown way out of proportion. We sometimes use this as an excuse to put all the blame on the person receiving if the healing does not manifest. And it's, it's, that's too simplistic. More often than not, it's the fault of the person praying as much as it is uh, the person receiving. However, with all that being said, it's still true that there must be some degree of faith operating in the person receiving the healing. Some degree, okay? So knowing that, Jesus took this blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. The Lord was busy infinitely more than I am. If, if you need healing today, I can't come pray for you. I don't have time to take you by the hand and walk you an hour out into the countryside to pray. Jesus wasn't just taking a stroll. His purpose was to get this man away from the unbelief and Bethsaida, knowing that it could hinder God's power from manifesting its healing. Hallelujah. So, however, even though Jesus got this man out of town, he perceived that he hadn't gotten all of the town out of the man. So he discerned that this man was still being affected by the atmosphere of unbelief. So after he prayed for him, he asked, what do you see? Now, Jesus wasn't asking, did God answer my prayer? Did anything happen? No, that would have been unbelief. The word says that you must believe you receive when you pray. For Jesus to have asked, did it work, would have violated his own teaching. The Lord knew that God had moved. He knew God's power was present, but it was in the spirit realm and needed to come into the physical. And Jesus was aware that the unbelief of that town and the effect that it had on the man was hindering an instantaneous full manifestation of what God had already done. So Jesus asked, how is it? And the man answered, I see men as trees walking. In other words, God's power had manifested to a degree. The man had been totally blind before, but now he could see a little bit. And you praise God for that little bit. Amen? But, so Jesus did something unusual again. He laid hands on him and prayed a second time. But it's unbelief to pray for something. Uh, somebody says, well, it's unbelief to pray for something twice. It is if you ask twice. <coughs> Excuse me. Then at least one of the two times you prayed in unbelief. You must believe that you receive when? When you see it, when you feel it, no, when you pray, when you pray. However, it is not unbelief to continue to pray, taking your authority and making what he has already provided manifest. Everybody following? If you have questions, just raise your hand. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll get through this together. Amen? It's not wrong to continue to pray if you understand that God has already released his power. In the spirit realm, it is complete, but you don't want... But you don't want it to just stay in the spirit. You want it to manifest in the physical. So you pray again, not doubting that God has already given, but to rebuke the devil. You pray to receive wisdom and revelation in case there's something that you must do. You pray to build up your faith and encourage yourself. Instead of just praying once and then trying to forget it, you are aggressively releasing your faith to deal with any hindrance and draw the provision into the physical realm. So Jesus confronted the hindrances head on. He didn't doubt his father's faithfulness, but he doubted this man's faithfulness, that the unbelief of this town was still hindering him from receiving. So he asked the man this question and saw that there was still some delay in the manifestation. And instead of just letting him go, Jesus kept ministering to him until he received the full healing. It's much, easy, much easier to keep something you've already got than to get something you don't yet have. So Jesus prayed for the man a second time. And if Satan unbelief or whatever the hindrance is can withstand one dose of the Holy Ghost, shoot him again. <laughs> Amen. Uh, just hit him again with the same power. This time the man received his healing and saw every man clearly. Hallelujah. Then Jesus told him not to go into the town or tell it to anyone there. So he instructed the man to go home. But where do you think he lived? This man may have had a job, family, and friends. Yet Jesus commanded him not to tell anybody or to go back into Bethsaida. That's a pretty strict requirement. Why? Jesus knew that even though this man had received the manifestation of healing, he could still lose it. This is important. He could still lose it 
if he immediately got back around all of that unbelief? How would he? I've seen people who start doing well and going forward in God, and you know they they, they get healed or just they're they're just really uh, making advancements in their in their relationship with the Lord, and then. Satan draws them back in with the same crowd of unbelief. And they, they take, you know, five steps back. And if we want to get to where God wants us to go, we have to guard our heart. And we have to make sure that we are around people who are believing. Amen? If I was to um, be diagnosed with some kind of incurable disease or sickness... I, I would not go blubbing my mouth about pray for me. I would go to a select few people in my life who I know believe, and I would have them, I, I would, well, first of all, I'd pray over myself, you know, and I just believe I receive. But I'm, I'm just saying, there's people who just go out there and say, pray for me, you know, for the masses. And uh, I, I just, I won't do that. I won't do that unless there's a select people that I know they, they believe. Amen? Just because I don't want... We don't have time for doubt and unbelief. Satan's not playing games. Satan is, is, is wanting to kill you. And he will use sickness and disease to do it. Amen? And uh, Satan's not playing around, you know? And we don't have time to play around. We've got to get our heart right. We've got to get our heart prepared and soft and tender to receive and, and, and built up in faith. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So, retention of your healing is not automatically guaranteed. God warned the man who had been healed at the pool of Bethsaida, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto you. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's nothing that he'd like better than to take away your manifestation, kill your faith, and destroy your testimony. And, and get you to question, you know, did God really heal me? Or did I just conjure that up in my head? I mean, this is how Satan works. He gets you to question things. You know, he approached Eve and, did God really say that? You know, did God really say you can't eat of the tree? And she's like, uh, yeah, he did. And Satan's like, well, you know, this is what God meant. This, God just doesn't want you to be like him. You know, you got to watch Satan. He's a sneaky little thing, you know. And, and instead of don't talk with the rat, just kill the rat. Amen? I mean, Satan is the father of lies. What, you think you're going to get any truth out of him? No, he ain't going to tell you the truth. Just squash the thing. Amen? <laughs> be done with it. Just, just squash the guy. So... And you have the authority and power in Christ to do that. Amen? <clears throat> so you must maintain your healing by faith. And that's why Jesus told the man not to go back into that unbelieving situation. Jesus knew that God had healed this man completely. It was already done. But he recognized that there was a hindrance to getting it from the spiritual into the physical. So the Lord prayed with him a second time in order to get this man over that hindrance. It wasn't because God was like, well, maybe God didn't release his full power. No. It was the man's unbelief, and so Jesus said, you know, uh, it was man's unbelief that was hindering full manifestation of the healing. So Jesus said, let me pray again um, so we can have full manifestation. So then he told him how to keep the healing that he had received. And I often encounter the same thing. People come to my meetings, and, uh, and we help them manifest a healing. Then they go back into unbelieving churches and submit themselves to a teaching that is totally opposite what they receive from me. Their sickness, <coughs> excuse me. Or disease returns, and then they come back to me the next time I'm in town and ask what happened. It's not God who took the healing away or put sickness back on them. They quit believing. They didn't have any root in themselves and so only endured for a season. God has already done everything. You're already blessed, healed, and prosperous, regardless of how you feel or what things look like. Okay? So you already have joy, peace, and wisdom. Everything you could ever need is already there in the Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. All you need to do is believe and receive. All right. If you don't see the manifestation immediately, don't doubt. Somebody say, don't doubt. Yeah. If you don't see the manifestation immediately, because my Bible says, if you are sick, go to the church, let the elders of the church lay hands on you and anoint you with oil. And the prayer of faith shall what? Save the sick. In Mark, what does it say? These signs will follow those who believe. Hallelujah. You will lay hands on the sick and they 
shall recover. Not might. If it be God's will, they shall recover. Hallelujah. <coughs> this is why I'm so confounded. Why people think that, well, God just might not want to do it. It's like, what Bible are you reading, you know? I mean, there's so many examples in here of this. So, if you don't see the, uh, don't doubt that God has already done it. Recognize that he is the spirit and that he moves in the spirit realm. For what he's done, what's already true in the spirit, to manifest in the physical realm, it requires the cooperation of some physical human being. Faith is the bridge that God's provision crosses over out of the spirit and into the physical. Sometimes it takes us a period of time to build ourselves up in faith to the point where we can receive, but it doesn't take God any time to be ready to give because he's already provided. Sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, it's demonic opposition that hinders what God has already done from coming into manifestation. Uh, sometimes other people are involved in our answers to prayer. Therefore, we must receive wisdom about how Satan is hindering so we can speak to the mountain and command it to be removed. So, again, every healing situation is unique. So, we have to listen to God's spirit. You know, God can be like, man, um, you know, the, the reason this uh, sickness came into your life is because... Um, you've been you've been treating you've been treating your wife really bad, or you've been treating your husband really bad. You've been having outbursts of anger, and and um, or you know you have unforgiveness in your heart. And it's not like it's not like God is sicking sickness on you to teach you a lesson. But when you're living in sin, you open the door up for the enemy. You know. So what I'm what I'm not saying understand is what I'm not saying is that you have to be perfect to walk in healing. Okay, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. That's not what I believe. Because there's nobody perfect but Jesus. Amen? So I'm not saying it, but I am saying that there are certain things that, that can open you up to sickness in your life. And um, so every, every healing situation is unique. And we just really need to... <clears throat> healing, I, I would say that healing is probably one of the... Um, not complex, but most di diverse or wider range of, of topics that's needed because healing stems from your relationship with God I mean plain and simple it's, it's not a math formula it's not do this and this and this and you'll receive healing comes from the heart right you receive healing with your heart <clears throat> and there are a variety of heart issues that can hinder your heart from receiving what God wants for you. So again, I'm not trying to scare you into like, oh, I have to have a perfect heart to receive. That's not at all what I'm saying. But some, in some instances, there are issues in the heart that can keep you from, uh, from believing or, or receiving. It's, it's, like a, it's like a blockade that you have. Of. And sometimes repentance is necessary to, to receive healing or you know, what, or reconciliation is necessary to, to bring healing in your life. And so I'm not saying that we have to work for our healing or be um, perfect to receive our healing because healing is by grace. But I'm just saying there can be things that will hinder you from walking in God's best in, in general. Amen. That can really cripple your faith. And so we have to be on the lookout for those things. I'm not talking about going on a witch hunt in your life, trying to uncover all kinds of weird sins. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying, seek God, listen to the Holy Spirit, because out of your relationship with the Lord comes healing. That's where your healing is in. It's in the relationship with the Lord. Amen? You don't need to, if you don't know something, don't worry about it. Be like, oh man, you know, maybe this is what it is. You just find yourself on just this like treasure hunt, and there, there's no treasure. You know what I'm saying? It's just distracting you. If, if there is something that the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you, amen, you don't need to waste your time trying to find it and stuff. So, again, healing stems from your relationship with the Lord. Praise God. So, <clears throat> um, therefore, we must receive wisdom about how Satan is hindering so we can speak to the mountain and command it to be removed. You need to learn and cooperate with the laws of God. You resist the devil. You speak directly to the problem. You exercise the authority and power God has given you. It is important to direct your prayers properly in order to receive your desired results. God has already done it, but it's your responsibility to believe and draw his provision into the natural realm. 
As soon as you can get yourself into faith and learn how to do this, you can manifest what God has already done. Instead of being a beggar, a pleader, a whiner, and a griper, you will become a commander. You'll believe what God has said he has done, and you'll take your authority and begin commanding it to manifest. So instead of just praying for healing, you will command healing. Amen? I'm not asking God for healing. I com I'm commanding, you know, speaking of the sickness and rebuking it. Because really, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I don't believe that God, who is life, wants something that is causing death living inside of my body. I really don't. I don't, I don't believe that God, who is life, wants something that brings death in my body. I don't believe that. Amen? So I get aggressive with whatever it is that's coming against my body. Amen? Because, because you know, this is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And, and this is, this, this is um, <clears throat> holy ground. Praise God. And sickness has no right to tread on this ground. It has no right. Jesus paid the price for us to be healed. And that's the mindset we have to approach sickness with. You have no right to be in my body. Praise God. Access denied. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you guys getting straight up in faith? I'm getting straight up in faith just talking about this. I mean, praise God. So instead of just praying for healing, you will command healing. Instead of just praying for blessing, you will command blessing. That's, that's a huge difference there. You need to understand that there is a real spiritual world. Through the window of God's word, you can see and accurately perceive the spirit realm. As you discover and meditate on what other people did and what was going on behind the scenes, you can be confident with the same thing, uh, that the same thing is going on around you today. Even though you cannot see it or feel it with your physical senses, you can perceive it with the eyes of your heart. Renew your mind to God's word and allow yourself to become a bridge that he can flow through from the spiritual realm into this physical world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, with that being said, <laughs> you may have any questions or comments. And if you have a question or comment online, um, go ahead and leave that, message us, or, or comment below, and uh, we'll definitely uh, get back to you. Amen? I know we asked a few questions during the, the teaching, so we're all good? Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop this. Sierra, welcome. See you're watching.